chapter 66. And I want to read in your hearing verse 13. Isaiah chapter 66, beginning at, well, just verse 13 is what I'll read. The Word of God says, as a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you. You will be comforted over Jerusalem. That's the Word of God. Isaiah says again, as a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you. You will be comforted over Jerusalem. I want to talk about for a few minutes an impactful image. An impactful image. Since this is Mother's Day, I will get back to the book of Job next Sunday. But this Sunday, I want to say something in relation to uh, Mother's Day. This past week, I read a very interesting article that was written by Andrew McDonald in Christianity Today. And the article was entitled, Don't Look Away. Why Ahmad Arbery's Tragedy Must Be Addressed Head On. The article addresses that those of us in places of privilege need to stand alongside our friends who are signaled out because of their race, faith, gender, socioeconomic status, etc. That we must continue to fight for justice and pray for those who are victimized for any reason at all. And within the article, McDonald states that for many people in America, Responding to the seemingly endless shootings of African Americans has become a horrific form of muscle memory. That after yet another tragedy like the shooting of Ahmad Arbery occurs, we, sim we, have, we see similar patterns. That there is this initial burst of reporting about it. It's followed quickly by social media commentary, that's followed by think pieces that come across various platforms, then it's followed by social media commentary on the think pieces that people have posted. Then within a week, the entire matter is tied up nicely and everyone is then able to move right along with their lives. That most of us forget as we return to being so engrossed in our daily lives, we forget only to be thrust back into the cycle when another shooting is jarring enough to penetrate the blaring noise of our daily news cycle all over again. The fact, he says, that our bearer was killed in February and many didn't know until May he said it speaks to our dependence upon images to incite responses. A dependency that, as many people have pointed out, it dehumanizes victims and establishes a bar proof we don't demand of others. That the fact that only images push us to take seriously these stories underlines the nature of our media landscape, that so few stories are not drenched in the political and cultural wars that theme our everyday that rise above the chaos to capture our attention, that many are feeling oversaturated, digitally burned out during our current crisis, and it only makes the problem of ignorance worse. He says the unfortunate truth is that even in our ability to go back into our own ignorance, we betray the disparity in our experiences and the systemic injustice in our culture that while the story will fade for most of us, for others, 
This story is their experience every day of their lives. They carry it with them when they wonder if it's safe to go for runs in their own neighborhoods or even to sit peacefully in their homes. I want you to notice carefully that McDonald states that horrific occurrences happen and they would be swept under the carpet, but there are images that incite a response. That if someone had not have had the image of the actual murder of Ahmad Arbery, then he, he's stating that no response would have taken place. And many live lives dealing with injustice and wrestling with abuse, being treated as if they have no meaning or purpose or if their lives don't matter because many times people don't pay attention to the images that are right before them. Well, it's always sad. If the images don't prod and push us to take action on what we see, with all the pain and suffering that's going on around us, certain images ought to incite a fire in us to be a voice for the voiceless, give hope to the hopeless, or be a sense of encouragement to those who are disencouraged. Which literally means we ought to pay attention to the images that give us pictures of how life ought to be lived out. I believe that as we are presently in this pandemic of COVID-19, that God himself in one way has given us an image that we can examine. That just in case there may be some who are having to endure the complex circumstances that have been brought on by corona or even injustices on the land, God has given us an image that portrays to us how he extends himself toward us. God would, 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 mo would most likely want us to know on this second Sunday in the month of May, year of 2020, that while you are in this pandemic, see him through the image of a mother. In the darkest and most hopeless of places, God himself uses motherhood to bring sense to insanity, to bring comfort to the terrified, and to bring hope to those who are lonely. There is a person who lived by the name of Hannah Smith who lived in the United States in the year of the 1850s and she was born into a Quaker family but later became this Wesleyan preacher and was one of the inspirations behind what's called the Keswick Convention. There was a passage of scripture that she read one day from the last chapter of the book of Isaiah. It spoke of how God's love for all people was like a mother's love for her children. For thus says the Lord, behold, I will extend peace to her like a river and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then you shall feed on her side shall you be carried and dandled on her knees and one whom his mother comforts so I will comfort you after reading the scripture this is what Hannah Smith wrote she says my children have been the joy of my life I cannot imagine more exquisite bliss than comes to one sometimes in the possession and companionship of a child to me there have been moments when my arms have been around my children that have seemed more like what the bliss of heaven must be than any other thing I can conceive of. I think this feeling, she says, has taught me more of God's feelings toward his children than anything else in the universe. That if I, a human being with limited capacity, can find such joy in my children, what must God with his, with his infinite heart of love feel toward his children? In in fact, most of my ideas, she says, of love and goodness of God have come from my own experience as a mother because I cannot conceive that God would create me with a greater capacity for 
unselfishness and self-sacrifice that he possessed himself and since this discovery of the mother heart of God I have always been able to answer every doubt that may have arisen in my mind as to the extent and quality of the love of God by simply looking at my own feelings as a mother do you not see what Hannah Smith is saying she's saying that she knows how her love is and what she does as a mother toward her children and since God created her she says there is no way that God has made her better toward her children than God himself is toward his children it's like she's saying God has given to the world an image of a mother so that it can incite a response on our part to love him deeper and love him greater all I'm trying to say to us this morning is all of us have some kind of connection with some mother in some capacity and however you are as a mother then please know God's love for you is greater than you have for your child and than you have as a mother he's given us the image that shows us in somewhat of detail that the way he loves us is greater than your mind can even fathom that when you think about it there is nobody that can beat a mother loving her child so what would that say about God and the way he loves you well I raise this because I don't I want you to see that whether you have children don't have children whether you are a mother not a mother whether this is a happy time for you or a sad time for you this is a time that you can actually discover that God's image of a mother can impact your whole COVID-19 experience God's entire image of a mother can impact your life no matter how depressed or down or difficult your life might be right now because he says again in Isaiah 66 in verse 13 he is pictured as a mother as he says a mother comforts her child so will I comfort you what would this image say to us about our God what kind of image impactful image do we get about God from looking at a mother I think if you look at the context from verse 1 down to verse 13 you kind of discover some things that you can learn about God from the impactful image of a mother one is simply this that God is showing to us through this that the impactful image of a mother shows us that he has higher concerns please notice if you will that that like a mother God notice what God is concerned about when you discover what God is concerned about you'll discover very plainly normally it's higher than what you may be concerned about the context of the te of, of, of this scripture is in, in chapter uh, chapter 66 is, is really the return of the Jews from their captivity in Babylon that it literally talks about what God uh, what God desires of his children in terms of their worship and their relationship to him it talks about how he's going to restore Jerusalem and how he will judge those who pretend faith in him it talks about this everlasting heaven and this everlasting hell but yet it speaks of his tenderness toward people who will seek after him for generations the Jews had come to believe that the temple itself was the place that God was most glorified in that the size of the temple and the structure of the temple was what God was ultimately interested in so imagine their shock when God says to them that the temple is not where his primary focus is because after all what would size mean and the, the big 
greatness of the temple mean to a God who is greater than the heavens? So look at how the chapter starts. In verse 1 it says, this is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where will my resting place be? For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look on him who is humble and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Please notice that God says, I sit on the throne and the truth and the earth is beneath me I don't need a place to sleep and whatever you have built you got all of that from me so what you may have your mind is not what sparks my interest God says it's not the place but rather certain people that I'm interested in notice that sometimes you can become so consumed with the idea that you need to get everything right Right in your life before God will be interested in you perhaps it's a belief that you think I need to become greater I need to do more before I'm entitled to the love of God but what God says is that the one person or group of people that catch his attention is the one who is poor and of a contrite spirit who trembles at his word I remember Jesus saying something like this in Matthew chapter 5 when he said blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven that it's those who know they are bankrupt in spirit those who know they're broke without proof of good those who know they are aware of their own depth of their sin it's these people who admit that they're poverty that they're really in poverty and without God it's those who are of country contrite heart and contrite literally means to be lame in the feet unable to do it on my own it's people whom the eye of God looks upon to be with that God would say my attention is on those who have humbled themselves to the point that they recognize they need me and they're not trying to live out their brokenness without my help I wish I had a witness here because God pays attention to people who clearly know on their own their lives are depleted. Perhaps we see the same in the heart of our mothers. It's not the proud or sufficient ones that a mother's heart reaches out to. It's the one who knows that they need their help. It's like the story of that mother who had 12 children and was asked which one she loved the best. Her answer was simple. She said, the one I love the best is the one who's sick until he gets well and the one who is away until he gets back home that God is saying my concern is not about what you think it is it's not about a house it's not about a car it's not about money it's not about materials he says I already own all that but what I'm concerned about is a person who is so broken that they can see how much they need me and because of their contrite humble spirit they they know they need me to come running to me so they can get help from me I'm not impressed God would say by anything but people who are poor in spirit and respect my word that's higher concern real mothers listen carefully are happy when you grow up make your own money they're excited when you get your family they're your number one cheerleader when you're successful and you're doing great but the higher concerns of a real mother is to get you to know Jesus for yourself when you see this heart of God you start to understand what the similarity in a person of a mother that loves God and loves him deeply so there's the impactful image of higher concerns. But then, secondly, like God, the impactful image is the head of creativity. Not just, um, not just higher concern, but head of creativity. Because notice, real mothers have unique gifts from God in that they're really creative. Notice the text back at verses 7 and 9. The Bible says, 
before she goes into labor, she gives birth. Before the pains come upon her, she delivers a son. Who's ever heard of such a thing? Who's ever seen such things? Can a country be born in a day or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Yet no sooner is Zion in labor than she gives birth to her children. Do I bring to the moment of birth and not give delivery, says the Lord? Do I close up the womb when I bring to delivery, says your God? Notice that in the context, God is speaking about how Israel managed to get free from Babylon. Was it a fight? Or was it by rebellion? No, it was by a Persian king by the name of Cyrus that God used to just let them go. That there was no labor. They were born again as a nation simply by grace. In other words, if you will just move toward God, tremble at his word, he'll move toward you in his great grace. It will take time and there will be a process to it. It won't be quick. It won't be as simple as you think really uh, or just turn in a moment but but a nation is not born that quickly but God is so faithful if you humble yourself seek him he'll follow through on his grace because he says again do I close up the womb when I bring when I bring to delivery shall I shall I who cause delivery shut up the womb so to speak God talks about what he created through the children of Israel Genesis you know narrates to us the creation story and all of us know that God gave birth to Israel through Jacob number of years after the death of Jesus on the cross the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed the nation of Israel scattered to all the nations in the world even Hitler tried his best to annihilate the Jews from the face of the earth God knows better than we know he always knows what he's doing so he gave birth to a new Israel in the year of 1948 and even though people and nations try to remove that nation from the face of the earth God always give birth to his nation no matter what people do in the world there is possibility there's no possibility if you have no birth that God makes things possible the question is how does God make things possible my answer is simple I don't know I can't tell you how he does all things I just know we witness him make things possible on a daily basis that he makes streams in the desert he he's he makes a way when there's no way he makes a possibility when there is none to be made the point is we always see God create something out of nothing God can give birth anytime he gets ready in the medical field this is re really impossible but who can stop to give birth wherever he desires and whomsoever he desires to do it I believe that's where mothers are found to be heads of creativity because because the truth of the matter is it's not that they're God but they've learned something from God that many people miss in life it's simple they know how to be creative about 10% of women, they say, encounter struggles with fertility. From ovulation, problems with endometriosis, uh, many of which can be overcome with medication or surgery. At first, not having a uterus was generally considered an unfixable fertility obstacle. It, it was like that at first, but the story of one mama in Sweden who lost her uterus during the battle with cancer told a different story. This mother who wanted to keep her name and her child's uh, name private had her uterus removed. And when she had it removed, she told the Associated Press that carrying a child became unimaginable to her. But then... Dr. Max Brandstrom, this pioneer of, 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 of a uterus transplant, provided his services. And the woman's mother offered to donate her uterus to a child. She said, I was crying and told her I loved her and thank you for doing it. And seeing her mother in the hospital uh, in a wheelchair before the surgery, she cries watching mama going to give her uterus to her daughter. This transplant was one of the first that was done by Dr. Brandstrom. The woman had to wait a full year before undergoing in vitro fertilization. And as doctors needed to be sure that the procedure
procedure was successful and pregnancy would be safe. She, she underwent three failed IVF sessions, but on the fourth one, she became pregnant. The woman delivered her baby boy without complications with, through a C-section, and the doctor said he felt this case is special because it's one uterus bridging three generations of a family. The mom said she hoped that this would create a special bond between her son and her mother, even though the conception story might seem unusual to people who were not in the family. She said her thought is, my son will always know how wanted he was and the real unique thing is what me and my mama went through to make sure my daughter would have a child do you see the mother went through that creative process just so her child could have a child that's what mothers do like God they create ways for their children to be taken care of some of you watching me now have seen it when you had no food long ago in the house and it was your mother who would take the leftover bread and create a full meal out of beans and bread or make some kind of gravy or make something you've never heard of before you've seen it how your mother created a way for you to get what you needed in life you've seen your mother show creativity and how she worked hard just so your dreams could be met and just so you can make it somewhere in life and just so you could be elevated because God can be seen like a mother because mothers always get their creativity from God when their children really need something. So like the impactful image, God has higher concerns. God has his head of creativity. But then like mothers, this impactful image shows that God is the heart of consolation. Notice verse 10 and 11. Rejoice, it says, with Jerusalem. Be glad for her, all you who love her. Rejoice greatly with her, all you who mourn over her. For you will nurse and be satisfied at her comforting breasts. You will drink deeply and delight in her overflowing abundance. Please notice quickly, God is saying, everyone who is connected to Jerusalem, and treats his children right, he says they will be blessed. He says they'll receive consolation because of how they treat his children. You do know God is always known as one who will console you. That like a mother, he consoles us one when we when he listens to us. Because God reveals himself as one who's always near enough to incline his ear in our direction. He listens attentively to us as his children and watches us very closely. And like a mother, God will console us because if no one else will incline their ear in our direction, a mother will lean toward her child and hear every concern that's on the child's heart. Is that not what a mother would do? She will incline her ear, but then she will intervene for her children if they call on her. And her, her, her intervention will always console her child. It's not just that God will incline his ear. It's not just that God will intervene, but with him also including himself with his presence, it means everything. Because consolation will simply involve being attentive and listening. It would involve intervening. It will involve including by being there. And God is a God who will allow his presence to provide his children with peace. Don't you know how better you feel when your life is turned upside down and your mama shows up where you are when you're having a hard time? It is consoling to have the presence or the inclusion of mother when life is against the wall. And just in case you think your mother can't console you by listening and 
intervening and showing up where you are. Have you ever considered how God, when he shows up, his presence makes your life whole, a whole lot better? The point is, if you find consolation in mama calling you, if you find consolation when mama walks in the hospital room, if you find consolation when mama knocks on the door, then don't you know God can console you in any situation if you just recognize him for it and what it, give him whatever your problem is. Well, he, he'll, he'll, he'll console you because he has a heart of consolation. He has a heart of consolation. He's the head of creativity. He has higher concern. But then this impactful image finally shows us that like a mother, God is the hand of comfort. That's when you get to verse 13. Where he says, as a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you and you will be comforted over Jerusalem. I'm done. This idea of comfort, it's all about simply the touch that God has on his children. You see, a mother's touch is different from anybody else's touch. Growing up, I remember, you, you could eat whatever mama might put on the table without fear. Because you know, if mama touched it, even if I don't like it, I know it's still good for me. I know whatever she gave me, she cared enough to make sure it's going to be something that I need. It'll be something that won't throw me off my path. No matter what mama would tell you to do or not to do. You know, you always knew mama always had your best interest in mind. She wasn't trying to keep you from having fun. Although, as a young child, you probably thought it. But when you got older, you start saying, no, mama wasn't trying to keep me from fun. She was trying to protect me from getting hurt. That, that, that's kind of relationship that we have ultimately with God. And when you compare it to a mother, again, he says, as one whom his mother comforts, so will I comfort you. That as her chill, his children, we really have no reason to fear whatever happens to us. We don't have to be jealous or envious of others. That's why the psalmist would tell us, don't be envious of the workers of iniquity. Because when you trust in the one whose hand is on your life. You already know it doesn't matter what the other people are doing. The good news is he'll comfort you. He'll touch you whenever something is wrong in your life. He says in, 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 in Isaiah 49 and verse 15, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born, though she may forget. Notice, the Bible says, I, God, will not forget you. Have you ever considered that on a human level, something can happen? Some illness can get a hold of your mama. She might not remember who you are. Something bad can take place. That because of, of, of a path you decide to go on in your life, some mothers will stop speaking to you and stop fooling with you and act as if they've forgotten that you are their children. But in the good news to know, God says, I will not forget you. That's because the touch and comfort of God, it's unique. It is infinite. It's, it's different than any kind of uh, comfort you've ever seen in your life. As a child of God, you can always know that God will remind you that he will touch you wherever your life is falling apart. And some Christians are prone to forget how real and precious the comfort of God is when they received him into their lives. Some people don't remember that the care of God has literally turned their lives around. 
But I've come to tell you that you are his child. And no matter where you're hurting on this day, there is no touch like the touch of God. Do I have a witness here that it does not matter how deep your pain may be? does not matter how strong your grief may be. It does not matter how painful the hurt that's taken place in your life. God is able to touch you and make it all better. Do I have a witness here? And just like God's can can touch you and make things better, his touch in the past has healed the sick and help the lame to walk his touch brought sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf no wonder mothers will bring their children to the Lord for a touch because a real mother knows when God will touch them it can turn things around do I have a witness in here I believe in a work for God because it worked some 10 years ago in the year of, of 2010 there was a lady by the name of Kate Og and her husband David they had some twins their twins were Emily and Jamie they were born 27 weeks early do I have a witness in here and when they were born the daughter came out and survived but Jamie was born 20 minutes after his sister and when he came out the doctors pronounced him dead do I have a witness they said he was dead and they said he was gone so Kate and David felt like it was over and said it was time for them to say their bye-byes to their little son so they went in the room and they asked could they just hold could mama just hold the Jamie one more time she grabbed Jamie and put her hands on Jamie pulled Jamie close to her heart and Jamie had a way of starting to move while he was laying on her chest doctor told her that's just reflective it's not real do I have a witness in here so Kate and David started hurting in their heart because they felt like they were seeing him move for the last time but he kept on moving while laying on his mama's heart do I have a witness she decided while she was patting him on the back to dip her hand in some breast milk and she put a little breast milk on her finger and put it up to his mouth and Jamie started to lick on the milk on her finger the doctor was amazed the doctor didn't understand it but all of a sudden he said it looked like that baby was so attached to mama's touch that because she touched him he came back to life I believe if it could happen with a human I believe if a mama can touch a dead son and he open up his eyes and start breathing again that we serve a God who's able in your situation to touch you no matter where you are to touch you no matter what you're going through to touch you no matter what your circumstance and make it all better he touched your life and you ain't never been the same he'll comfort you he'll care for you that's why you ought to give him all you have cause nobody can touch 
you like the Lord. I know it's an empty sanctuary, but I feel like it's full now because I'm thinking about how he touched me. He touched me with a finger of his love. He touched me early this morning and I opened up my eyes. He touched me when I was on my way to hell and now I got a relationship and because he touched me do I have a witness because he touched me life ain't never been the same if you've been touched by the Lord you ought to give him the only praise that you got if it had not been for the Lord on my side I don't know where I would be but oh, yes, sir. Ah, he's all right. Yes, he is. If you've been touched, lift your hands where you are. If you've been touched, lift your hands wherever you are. And tell him, thank you for touching me. Thank you for giving me comfort. Thank you for making a way for me. Thank you for opening doors for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You don't know Christ in your life. I want to invite you to know the one who can be better to you than a mother could ever be. That's a, those are strong words to say that somebody can be better than a real mother. Because only real mothers know how they love their children. When you make a comparison, even to the way that a mother would love her child, it can't be compared how God is toward us. So if you don't know him, I invite you to get to know him. Accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Believe that he died for your sins. Believe that he rose on the third day. And confess your sins. If you're backslidden, I want you to know he's so loving that he will accept you back just like you are. He'll give you a new start. If you don't have a church home, we invite you just to Make a comment on the screen. We get in touch with you. Or you can reach us on Facebook. You can call the church. Because we want you to be connected to God. To know about his love, his care, his concern for you. Christ didn't go to Calvary for you to spend your eternity in hell. He went to Calvary to save your life. With our heads bowed. Father, we thank you so much. Thank you for your love. Thank you for how you care so much about us. Thank you for the impactful image of mothers that when we look deeply, we can examine them at times and see great pictures of who you are. We can see how much you love us. We can see how you will come to our defense. We can see how you'll console us. We can see how you will create things in our lives that we didn't ever think could happen. We can see that you're going to console us no matter what we're going through. And we can see how you're going to comfort us in every situation. God, I pray that your people would hear the cry and call that even you're making to them in times like these. That this pandemic situation is not just something to live through, but it's a time that we can discover more about you and really and truly see the need to turn our lives over to you so you can work in us for real. We love you so much. and We thank you for all you've done. It is in your son's name we pray, amen and amen. My brother and my sister, I encourage you to spend some time with the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord about your life and your family's life. Enjoy your Mother's Day to all mothers. If you don't have a mother, talk to somebody that'll put a smile on your face. Don't talk to anybody negative today. Just find somebody that will make you smile or make yourself smile. Watch a movie. Tell yourself a joke that are not, not even funny, but do something <laughs> just to make yourself happy. We'll be back in the book of Job next week, so please join us next week. Please make sure that you give. If you haven't given already, 
You can mail it to the church or you can bring it by church. You can pay on Givelify, PayPal, or Cash App. We encourage you to make sure you make the connection. We love you so much. We thank you for tuning in. Happy Mother's Day. Now the love of God, the grace of our Lord, and the Savior Jesus Christ. Sweet communion with the Holy Spirit. Rest through with all in the Bible with all of us now, henceforth and forevermore. And let's all say together, Amen. Y'all be blessed.